When we think of Moses receiving the law on Mount Sinai, what are some things that come to mind? I want to go ahead and have you shout some things out. What are some things that come to mind when you think about Moses at Mount Sinai? Just a few things. You can just shout them out. No particular order. Okay, maybe, maybe a little bit slower and a little bit louder. Sorry, I got, I got caught off guard there. Maybe just a few things. And just sort of, again, one more time. Okay. Maybe one or two more. Okay, yeah. All right. Well, thank you for shouting some things out. I think there are, yeah, a lot of things that come to mind. This is, for most of us, it's probably a very familiar account. Think about Moses coming to Mount Sinai to meet with God. I wrote some things down myself, and there's a bit of overlap here, but think when I think about this, I we think that God is there. God is there. We think of maybe thunder and quaking that takes place during this encounter. He gives, we, that Moses receives instructions from God, maybe even thinking about the people rebelling, even pulling on Exodus 32. Moses meeting with God and his face glowing from the encounter. There's a whole lot that takes place, but something that I don't think we often consider is Jesus at Mount Sinai. Now, when I say that, I think that that may cause some of you to, may cause some eyebrows to raise when I even say that, Jesus at Mount Sinai. I think we understand just at a fundamental level that our triune God is behind the events at Mount Sinai. I don't think anyone would argue with that, but Jesus at Mount Sinai. Even when I say that, it may sound a little bit strange to you, and I hope the concept is less strange after our time together in God's Word today. But it probably does bring up some questions. You're thinking, well, was Jesus, how, do we know that Jesus was there in particular? Was he involved in the giving of the law? I think those are great questions, and they're ones that I hope that, we said, that we're able to answer today in our time together. I think that we will see Jesus in our time together this morning with the study that we have before us. We're going to be looking at Exodus chapter 18 through chapter 20. Um, if you like, you can go ahead and turn to Exodus 18. You can do that now. But just so you know where we're going, the scope of our study, I do think we see Jesus in our text, and we'll build our way up to get there. Uh, we'll actually, I think we'll see him early on. I think we'll see him a little bit later on as well, possibly even at Mount Sinai. And so if this is your first time joining us, you might be thinking, what is this guy talking about? Why are we talking about Jesus in Mount Sinai? Why are we talking about Jesus in the book of Exodus at all? Well, the reason that we're talking about this, the reason that we're having this conversation is because this is something that Jesus points us toward. And you might be thinking, when does Jesus do that? Well, in John chapter 5, verse 46, in rebuking the religious leaders, he says, if you believed Moses you'd believe me because Moses wrote about me. So Moses, the author of the first five books of your Bible, was writing about Jesus. And in case you're thinking, well, maybe Je Jesus didn't mean what he said. Of course he did. He's God. But he says it again in Luke 24, and Luke says it as well. So this is a threaded expectation. It's more than an expectation. It's a reality that Jesus is in the books of Moses. Now, does that mean every single word is a reference to Jesus? No, but I think there are places where he does reveal himself. And so what we've been doing in this study is we've been following, trying to trace, if you will, breadcrumbs that I think have been left for us where we can see uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, the pre-incarnate Christ, rather, revealed to us. And so that's what we've been doing so far. Uh, we've been going from Genesis, and we'll be, make our way into Deuteronomy right now. We're midway through the book of Exodus, but we've seen Jesus quite a number of times in our study together if you've been with us already. And so in Exodus 18, if you've turned there, we're not going to jump into that right away. I want to just do a little bit of recap because we left off in Exodus 17 last week. We looked at Exodus 17 verses 1 through 7. We didn't cover the rest of that chapter. But what happened afterwards, after the, the water coming from the rock, is we saw, or we didn't see, but what happens is the Amalekites, they come up and they fight against Israel. And it was an evil thing for them to do to attack Israel. And we know that not just from the book of Exodus, not just from Exodus 18, but we know that as well from corresponding scriptures, one of them being from Deuteronomy 25, 19. Moses writes, therefore it shall come about when the Lord your God has given you rest 
from all your surrounding enemies in the land which the Lord God gives you as an inheritance to possess, you shall blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. You must not forget. So those are very strong words, strong words in the book of Numbers as well. And you might be thinking, well, you know, why exactly are they so strong? Well, Israel had just come out of Egypt, like it had not been a long time at all. You know, within a, the course of just a couple of months, they've been attacked by uh, the Amalekites. God was with Israel. God is watching over Israel. And they come up and they're in a front to not only God's people, but to God himself, even pulling on the threads of what we studied last week. When Moses and Aaron were rebuked, it was considered to be a rebuke of the Lord himself. But Joshua defeated them. Joshua and the Israelites defeated the Amalekites, and that caused the curse to be upon the Amalekites. And it's an account you may remember where Moses has his hand lifted, and when his hand would drop, then the Amalekites would start to win, and so they put a rock under his hand so that his hand would remain up. But God says that he himself, in Exodus 17, 16, would war with the Amalekites from generation to generation. And so this was an ongoing uh, thing that would take place because of what the Amalekites had done to the Israelites. But after this deliverance had taken place, the people, they continue to travel. They continue to travel all the way, and they're moving towards, at this point, Mount Horeb. Now, Mount Horeb is where the people met with, or where Moses, rather, met with God in Exodus 3.2, and Mount Horeb is also known as Mount Sinai. You might be thinking, well, why does this mountain have two names? Um, Back in Exodus 3, I gave the example of um, Mount McKinley, uh, also being referred to as Mount Denali. And so it's one mountain. It's got two different names. And it could be that these names were used just depending on uh, what side of the mountain you were on or, you know, basically even just your heritage with what it was referred to as. Regardless, this was familiar ground. Familiar ground for Moses. He had been here before. Last time he was there... He met with the angel of the Lord, and the angel of the Lord told Moses to remove his sandals because the ground he was standing on is holy ground. And so they're approaching the mountain. They're on their way, and that's where we get to our the beginning of our text today. We're not going to go through all of Exodus 18 through the beginning of chapter 20. We'll hit sections, highlight sections as we go through. I do want to read verses 1 through 4. That's where we'll begin this morning. The text reads, Now Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people, how the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took Moses' wife Zipporah and after he had sent her away and her two sons, of whom one was named Gershom, for Moses said, I've been a sojourner in a foreign land. The other was named Eleazar, for he said, The God of my father was my help and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. We'll pause there. So we are introduced to Jethro again. This is not the first time we've been introduced to him, even in our study that we've been going through so far in the Redeemer according to Moses. Back in Exodus chapter 2, verse 16, we were introduced to Jethro as the Midianite priest. Now, we see that title for, here, for him here as well, at which point you might be thinking, well, doesn't that mean that he's a pagan? Like, after all, it doesn't say that he's a Levitical priest. Are there other priests? Well, he may be a pagan man, not 100% convinced of that. It's possible that he is. Something to bear in mind with this conversation is that the Levitical system as we know it was not yet established. It wasn't. Like Levi was around, the descendants of Levi. We know Aaron is here already, but the Levitical system as we know it began to be established in Exodus 28 verses 1 through 3. And so we don't have that quite yet at this point. And up to this point, we have seen non-Levites function as priests. You might be thinking, so you could be thinking through who those people might be. Abraham, for example, he offered sacrifices before the Lord. Uh, we have Job, we have Jacob, Noah, all of them acting as priests and offering sacrifices before the Lord, uh, likely on behalf of people. And the point is, at this point, just because we see the Midianite priest, because we see that designation, it does not de facto mean that he's rebelling against the Levitical priestly order, for example. Being a priest from Midian, it did not necessarily mean that he was directly going against God just because of where he was from or because of his background. So he is a priest, 
He's sacrificing on behalf of the people and likely praying for them on their behalf. So he's the Midianite priest. But Jethro doesn't just go by the name Jethro or the Midianite priest. He has another name as well. In Exodus 2.18, he's called Ruel. And that means friend of God, which is interesting. Like, we at least have to speculate that's interesting. Because if I ask you, do you know of others that are referred to as friends of God in Scripture? We should be saying yes. There are others by that designation. For example, Abraham being one of them. We see that in James 2.23. Who else is referred to, who else are referred to as friends of God? Well, the disciples are, and you and I are by extension as well. We see that in John 15, 15. Jesus says, no longer do I call you slaves, for a slave does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that you have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. If you love Jesus this morning, you are a friend of of God. And I hope those words hit you with the weight that they're intended to. That's an amazing, overwhelming reality that we would be called friends of God. Those who were his enemies now, friends, sons, joint heirs with Jesus Christ. I think it's possible that Jethro, I think it's possible that he fears the Lord, even before what we read in our text this morning. I don't know for certain. No, don't know. I think it's possible, though. I think it's difficult for us at first when we consider that to wrap our heads around that because he's from Midian. He is hundreds of miles away from Israel in Egypt, those that are supposed to be worshiping the true God. How is it possible? How is it possible that he could be a worshiper of the true God? Well, I think that his family, his descendants, did know about the living God. How would that be possible? Well, I imagine that Abraham passed along stories about God to his children. Do you think Abraham would do that? You can do a shaking of the head, yes or no. Do you think Abraham would pass down stories about God to his kids? Yeah, I think he would. I think it's hard to, for us to fathom a man that is a friend of God, someone that loves God, not doing that, not passing down stories about the God that he loves. And if that's the case, then it's not just Isaac who's born of Sarah that would have heard these stories, but also the children born through Keturah. Now, some of you are thinking, who is Keturah? I've heard, Sarah I've heard of before. I've heard of Hagar before, but who is Keturah? Well, after Sarah died in Genesis 25.1, we read, Now Abraham took another wife whose name was Keturah. And guess who came through her? You guessed it. The Midianites did. We read in Genesis 25 too, she bore to him Zimron, Jokshan, Medan, and Midian, and Ishbak, and Shua. Midian comes through Keturah, and so Midian was one of Abraham's sons. I don't think we often think about that, but that's the fact of the matter. And if Abraham had diligently instructed Midian and the Lord and his other children, then I imagine that would have carried through his descendants. Now it's speculation. We can't know for sure. I think it's possible that Jethro knew the Lord, that he loved the Lord, um, even with the actions that he displayed and the trust of Moses and welcoming Moses in in Exodus chapter 2 and even what we see this morning. So back to our text. Jethro has heard of, he's heard of what, who did for Moses and Israel. What do we see in our text? He hears, uh, he has heard of all that God had done for Moses and Israel his people, how the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt. Now, I want you just for a moment, let's think back to Exodus 3.8. Very important encounter. It's a G, uh, Moses meeting with the angel of the Lord in the burning bush. And when he speaks, he says, I have come down. Well, yeah, the angel of the Lord did. He was displayed in the burning bush. I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Amorite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. So well, in our text, we see that God did this. In this text, we see that the angel of the Lord did. Now, when you read the text, it says that he's speaking. Uh, it, it says God speaks. We see the angel of the Lord, and we see God speaking. I believe it's in Exodus 3, 4. The angel of the Lord is the one that says that Moses is standing on holy ground. Now, 
Again, if you're just joining us for the first time, a lot of this study is weighted upon different passages that we've considered together. For example, Exodus 33, 20, no one can see God and no one can see God at any time and live. Uh, John 1, 18, no one has seen the Father except the Son. That's a paraphrase. You see it in John 6, I believe 64. You see it in 1 Timothy, I think it's 6, 16. There's this constant thread that no one can see God. No one has seen God. But for Trinitarians, we have no issue with that because no one can see the Father. No one can see the Father and live, but the Son can be seen, and the Son is seen. We see that in the account with Jacob wrestling with God, claiming that he's seen God. In fact, in Exodus 3, which we've already studied, Exodus 3, 6, Moses claims that he has seen God. But again, who is in the burning bush but the angel of the Lord? The angel of the Lord is there, and so what we have argued so far is that when we see the angel of the Lord, what we're seeing is the pre-incarnate Christ. I don't think the angel of the Lord is just an ordinary angelic messenger, but the pre-incarnate Christ himself. But on top of that, so we're talking about deliverance from Egypt, that promise in Exodus 3.8, but there's another thing that we just saw in a previous study two studies ago. In Exodus uh, chapter 4, verses 19 through 20, We read about the angel of God, and we're thinking, who is the angel of God? In these verses, we read the angel of God, who had been going before the camp of Israel, moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them. So it came between the camp of Egypt and the camp of Israel, and there was a cloud alongside with the darkness, yet it gave light at night. Thus, the one did not come near the other all night." Well, as we studied before in Exodus 3.21, the one that was moving before the people is the Lord himself. And so we were arguing that the Lord is equated with the angel of God, arguing that Jesus himself was the one leading people out of Egypt, delivering them from slavery in Egypt. And so all of that is to say, who is Jethro referencing here? I think he is referencing our Lord, but I think that we do see Jesus highlighted in this text. I think this is a text that Moses was writing about Jesus in, So Jethro heard the news. He heard the news. That means the news spread quickly, didn't it? It spread far and wide throughout the land. Midian is hundreds of miles away from the Nile River, for example, even from where the people were in Egypt, but the news had already gotten there. And then I think we pause for a moment and we think, but how could it not? Like when you think about all that God had done before the people, the plagues upon the people, the Nile turning to blood, people having boils, Egyptians perishing, the strongest army in the world being swallowed into the heart of the sea. In fact, by the time you get to Joshua, the book of Joshua, just some 40 years after where we're reading today, they're in the promise, they're moving into the promised land. We read in Joshua 2 verses 8 through 10, Now, before they lay down, she, Rahab, came up to them on the roof, and she said to the men, I know the Lord has given you the land, and that the terror terror of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you. Verse 10, for we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. She goes on to speak about battles that the Lord would, subsequent from where we're studying today, that he would deliver Israel from. But make no mistake, the people of the world knew what God had done. This news traveled fast, and it was all according to plan. No accident with how this had taken place. In fact, it's something we should come to expect, even from what we'd uh, seen in Exodus chapter 9. Moses was charged to speak with to Pharaoh, and we read in verses 13 through 16, rise up, this is, the Lord said to Moses, rise up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh and say to him, thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, let my people go that they may serve me. For this time I will send all my plagues on you and your servants and your people so that you may know there is no one like me in all the earth. Now, that's a purpose statement primarily for Egypt. I understand that. They, they would recognize who God is. He is God in him alone. All of their idols, all of their gods are false. They're fake. They don't really exist. And then verse 15, for if by now I had put forth my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence, you would have been, then been cut off from the earth. 
Verse 16, but indeed for this reason, I have allowed you to remain in order to show you my power and in order to proclaim my name through all the earth. Did you catch the last part there? There is an expectation that the Lord's name would go forth through the land because of what took place in Egypt. God's power, the demonstration of his power would travel very quickly throughout the land, and that is exactly what we see take place here with Jethro. Jethro knows about it. He knows what has happened. And we see a reference to Moses' wife and children. He must have missed them both, he must have missed them all. And we see the names there, Elie, their names with reference to his life story. Elias are in particular to what God had done in his story. God was central in this family. God is the one that they worshiped, and I think we see that even from how the children are named. But let's go ahead and read verses 5 through 12 as the story continues to unfold. Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife to Moses in the wilderness where he was camped at the Mount of God. He sent word to Moses, I, your father-in-law Jethro, am coming to you with your wife and her two sons with her. Then Moses went out to meet his father-in-law, and he bowed down and kissed him. And they asked each other of their welfare and went into the tent. Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done to Pharaoh and the Egyptians for Israel's sake, all the hardship that had befallen them on the journey, and how the Lord had delivered them. Jethro rejoiced over all the goodness which the Lord had done to Israel in giving them and delivering them from the hand of the Egyptians. So Jethro said, Blessed be the God who delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of Pharaoh, who delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all the gods. Indeed, it was proven when they dealt proudly against the people. Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took a burnt offering and sacrifices for God. And Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat a meal with Moses' father-in-law before God. So the people at this point, they had just, they're, they're coming to the Mount of God. And this had been a long journey filled with much complaining. If you were here last week, we saw them complaining over and over again. You would think after all that had been accomplished, that Exodus 15 would be their anthem, that it would be the song that they sing with uh, plenty or little. That wasn't the case. Even still, they made it, and that really is a testimony to the Lord's faithfulness and His grace. They were desiring to be back in Egypt. They didn't want to die in the wilderness. They were mocking God by mocking His messengers, but God remained true to His word. And God didn't just bring them out of Egypt. He did that, but He did beyond that. Beyond that, and this was something that He had promised to them that He would do. He promised that He would bring them to this mountain in particular, and He did it. God had guaranteed that this would be accomplished. The angel of the Lord told Moses in Exodus 3.12, Certainly I will be with you, and this shall be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. Sent you. When, not if, when you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God at this mountain. So not only did God deliver them out of Egypt exactly as he said, but he's bringing them to the exact location that he promised that he would. It's all according to God's sovereign plan. And Moses, he gets this, what I imagine at this point, I know Jethro is highlighted primarily, but this long-awaited family reunion. Jethro's coming with your wife, he says in verse 6, and your two sons. Verse 7, we see the father-in-law is highlighted. But I imagine this is just a sweet moment. A wonderful moment. He bows down before him. This is not him worshiping him. This is him showing adoration. He's kissing him. He's overwhelmingly grateful to be back with his family. You've probably seen the videos every once in a while of a, a, a soldier coming back from war and then coming and surprising his children. Just these sweet emotional moments. And I think that's probably something like what we would see here if we were there. Just a wonderfully great moment of a family being reunited. You have a husband and father being here with his family. See Jethro and Moses, possibly the rest of his family, they go into this tent to catch up with one another. You can understand that. This would be a sweet reunion, telling of all that the Lord had done, 
telling of how he had provided for the people even amid their unfaithfulness. He'd speak of the trials they'd gone through. He'd be full to the brim with stories. And we see a glimpse of that in verse 8. Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake, all the hardship that had befallen them on the journey and how the Lord delivered them. I think if you were to unpack what that conversation looks like, it would look like what we have studied so far, but then so much more, so much more detail. I think it would include God appearing to Moses. I think it would include God's promise of deliverance, Moses going before Pharaoh, Pharaoh not listening to Moses, not listening to God, God pouring out these plagues upon the people, Moses vividly describing what that was like, not just for Egypt, in what they suffered, but also as the people of Israel are experiencing this suffering displayed upon Egypt and for the first three plagues upon themselves as well, because Israel was included in those. The plagues got to the point where Pharaoh's magicians couldn't even mimic what was going on any longer. The gods of Egypt didn't do anything because they didn't exist. Then the night of the Passover is instituted. It's a meal they continue to keep so they look back on the night when God slayed the firstborn in the land of Egypt. Israel's firstborn, were, they were spared. And God gives the final and culminating sign in parting the Red Sea. Egypt had chased the people in there. Think about Moses describing that event. Lifting his staff, as the Lord says, in the waters parting. Think about him describing all these people, seemingly a sea full of people, walking through the sea. Pot, mil, uh, you know, if you're using Numbers chapter 1, pot, you know, likely at least 1.5 million people, possibly up to 2 million people going through this sea that has been parted. Talking about that event, talking about the moment when the Egyptians came in after them, talking about the moment when he lowered his hand and the sea collapsed in upon itself. He'd go beyond that, though. He'd go on to speak about how God, after this moment had happened, how the people had gone out into the wilderness. He'd talk about how God miraculously provided for them, how the people complained, and yet how God was faithful even when they didn't deserve it. God's love and kindness would be on display here, I believe, as he's talking to Jethro. God so loves Israel, though they didn't deserve it, that he protected them even when they did not want God. He showered them with blessings, provided water for them. He provided food for them, all amid their complaining. And here they are, coming before Mount Sinai. And Jethro's heart, after hearing all of this, it would be filled with wonder and amazement. Like he's heard about the events taking place, but just seeing how God was faithful from the very beginning to the very end with these events, even with the people now being at the mountain that God had promised that they would be at. And we see that in verses 9, and 11, 9 through 11. I know we've read them. I want to read them again. Jethro rejoiced. He rejoiced over all the goodness which the Lord had done to Israel in delivering them from the hand of the Egyptians. So Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord who delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of Pharaoh who delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know the Lord's greater than all the gods. Indeed, it was proven when they dealt proudly against the people. Then Jethro goes on to, and then uh, afterwards in the account as it goes on, if you were to read further, you see that Jethro yeah, he offers sacrifices to the Lord making much of the God that he just blessed and proclaimed blessing upon. There's no God like this God. We see an iteration of that in his statement. He cries out, blessed be the Lord. I mean, it's like, this is what we want to see. It's what Pharaoh didn't do. It's what Israel hadn't been doing in chapter 16 and 17. And yet he's doing it. He's praising the Lord. He's so grateful to see what God had done for these people. He wasn't a part of what went on, but he's so happy. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. That's sort of the echo or the theme that we see here. And then uh, it's just wonderful. And I realize when you see verse 11, this could be, again, this could be understood as Jethro coming to believe in the Lord for the first time. And it may be that he comes to love the Lord for the very first time in this moment. Uh, the other way of understanding this would be re with regard to confirmation. Jethro already trusted in the Lord. He expected that God was more powerful than anyone or anything else. And he's saying here, I know it's true. I thought it was. I believed it was. Now I know it is. Confirmation. Um, 
You could take it one of two ways. And I, you know, I'm not going to settle that for you today. I can't say it's 100% settled in my own mind. But regardless, what is most important is his state now. He's so thankful for what God has done. And we see him worshiping the Lord, preparing sacrifices for the Lord. That's a mark of someone that treasures him. Now, I would have loved, I would have loved to be, have, have been in this meeting tent. Like, I, I imagine there were smiles there. I imagine there were tears that were shed. Like, this has been unlike any other period in Moses' life. He has been seeking to strive with these people who have been striving against them. He has seen this awesome display of God's power over and over again. And here he is. He's an older man. He's over 80 years old. His family's there worshiping the Lord. Like, I think in some ways, they are what Israel should look like. Like, you have Moses, the Midianite priest, and I'm just presuming at some point here you have his wife and his children involved in worshiping the Lord. And yet Israel doesn't really have that. They're not knit in the same fashion at this point. What happens next after this encounter where they're rejoicing in the Lord is you have uh, Moses seeking to watch over the people. Difficult task strenuous task. Moses has so much on his back, and Jethro effectively comes along and says at the end of chapter 18, hey man, you can't do this on your own. And he's right. Moses was seeking to do too many things, and so Moses listened. He listens to the Midianite priest. He listens to Jethro. He chooses people to watch, help him watch over the people, shepherd, care for the people. And that was a wise thing to do. That was God's design. It's something that God echoes elsewhere. We see him appoint 70 different people, and then after that, Jethro, he returns back to his homeland. And that's the last word we see about Jethro in all of our Bible. But I think he does appear to love the Lord. He helps Moses. He he seems to even be making a decision, one that God would um, affirm with Moses delegating responsibility, and Moses bids him farewell which brings us to Exodus 19. I want to go ahead and read verses 1 through 2 just to orient us here. In the third month after the sons of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that very day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. When they set out from Rephidim, they came to the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness, and there Israel camped in front of the mountain. So here the people are. The stage is set. Everything exactly as God had promised, they're directly in front of it. They have their camp set up. And this brings us to a passage that I think you're probably more familiar with, verses 3 through 6. Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the sons of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples. For all the earth is mine. Now you And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of of Israel. Now, when we read this on its face, this is a spectacular encounter. This is one that you've almost certainly looked at before. It's something you've considered even in light of what Peter says in 1 Peter with reference to uh, 1 Peter 2 uh, with reference to being a holy uh, nation or kingdom of priests and a holy nation. But before we delve in and sort of navigate through some of these verses a little bit more, I want us to hit the pause button here because I want to draw your attention to another text to make a connection for us that I think will assist us in our understanding here. Now, right before Stephen's death, so he's preaching against the hypocrisy of the Jewish people, and he says in Acts chapter 7, verses 36 through 38, this man, referring to Moses, led them out performing wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. This is the Moses who said to the sons of Israel, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. This is the one, verse 38, in the congregation in the wilderness together with the angel who is speaking to him on Mount Sinai and who was with our fathers, and he received living oracles to pass on to you. 
you might know where I'm going to go with this. I think this is a really interesting statement that we see from Stephen here because it's something that we might not pick up on if we don't have it in the text here. Who was Moses speaking to on Mount Sinai? What did Stephen just say? He says in verse 38, the one who is in the congregation in the wilderness, together with the angel who is speaking to him on Mount Sinai. In Exodus 19.3, we see that the Lord is the one talking, but here in Stephen's speech, we see the angel is talking to Moses on Mount Sinai. And we just read this in verse 3, Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the sons of Israel. Is it possible that they're referring to one and the same? I'm not being I'm super dogmatic here. I think it's possible. I think it's likely that it's referring to one and the same here. I think that Stephen is implying that the angel that he's speaking of is God, which would not be out of character with what we see in the Old Testament at all. Now, again, I am not at all saying or implying that the Father and the Spirit are not involved in this. That is not what I'm saying. Like This is, comes forth from our God. All I'm trying to show you, I think there's possibly a breadcrumb here indicating who Moses is speaking with. I think he's speaking with the angel who, if we combine these texts, the angel who is God. And if that's the case, it sure sounds like the angel who's God from Exodus 3, doesn't it? I think so. The angel of the Lord appears, God speaks, he's on holy ground, take off your shoes. Verse 6, Moses is afraid, he saw God. The angel of the Lord in Exodus 3, we argued, is equated with God. And the encounter sounds, sim the encounter sounds similar here. In fact, if it is the case, then the angel of the Lord is meeting with Moses in the exact same location again for a second time, which again would seem to correspond with what we read in Exodus 3 through 4. John Gill says of this passage, the same angel as before in Acts 7.30 and refers to his speaking to him, then saying, I am the God of thy fathers, which was at Mount Sinai, or rather to the time when the law was given on that mount. It may be both. It's true of each, though it may more especially regard the latter. For it was the angel of the divine presence, the second person of the Trinity, the word of God that bid Moses come into the mount." Now, if this is the pre-incarnate Christ, the one that I argue that we saw in Exodus chapter 3, well, he speaks to Moses and he says in summary, you saw what I did to the Egyptians. It's effectively what we see here. You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians. We see that in Exodus 19.4. In Exodus 3.20, the angel of the Lord says, so I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my miracles, which I shall do in the midst of it. And after that, he will let you go, would bring about the plagues upon Egypt. He's speaking with Moses, possibly again right here in Exodus chapter 19. God is telling Moses, you know who I am and what I can do. I think that's what we see here in our text. And he goes on to introduce a covenant with the people. If they're faithful, they will be God's possession. And that is such a promise. This is foreshadowing what we'll see in Exodus chapter 20 and following. In case there's any confusion, there's, we see pretty directly here, the earth is mine, the world belongs to the Lord. And we see David say an iteration of that in Psalm 24, 1, the earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. He desires Israel would be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. In other words, he desires they would look different than they had the past, in the past few months. They would look very different than how they'd been acting as of late. What characterized them was complaining, not holiness, but that shouldn't be the case. What God's clear about here is that he is setting them apart for himself. They were not to look like the other nations. That's big. They were to be holy unto the Lord. When you read about the dietary and the ceremonial laws, I know sometimes it's difficult for us to understand, like, why did God do that? 
Why could they eat this and not that? What was the purpose of these things? Well, there were some different reasons, but the main one was that they would look different than the nations around them. They would look different. They would dress different. They would act different. They would walk different. They would eat different. They would worship differently. With everything they were, they were called to be a people that followed the Lord, doing whatever he asked. There was no God like this God, and the world was to know that. What's fascinating is that even through their difference from the watching world, that was meant to be a light to attract the nations to God in the Old Testament. And I think we see a grand display of that in 1 Kings 8 through 10, which is the highest moment in Israel's history before one of their worst falls. 1 Kings 10, verses 23 through 25, we see, So King Solomon became greater than all the kings of the earth, in riches and in wisdom. All the earth was seeking the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom, which God had put in his heart. They brought, him, they brought every man his gift, articles of silver and gold, garments, weapons, spices, horses, and mules, so much year by year. The nations were coming. The world was coming to Israel. They were coming to Jerusalem to hear of wisdom from Solomon, which had come from God himself. They're bringing the fruit of their land, of their produce with them. The nations are. The nations, for a brief moment, appear to be uniting themselves with Israel, uniting themselves with the Lord. It's a great moment. It doesn't last long. When you get to, I mean, indications that things are wrong at the very end of 1 Kings chapter 10, Solomon is accumulating uh, a bunch of uh, uh, horses for himself. If you remember in number 17, there's a warning for the future kings of Israel. And uh, I had a, a <laughs> professor in seminary that used to say, uh, don't, don't get for yourself uh, girl goals or giddy up. Uh, those, were the, those were the three things you don't accumulate as a king. And uh, we'd already seen uh, the girls portion. Uh, things are not right with Solomon. Uh, we'd seen the gold portion, and then we see the giddy up at the end of chapter 10. But uh, he'd accumulated those things, and then he falls in 1 Kings chapter 11. The, the, the ladies he's with, they drew his heart away from God. Terribly sad thing. We can talk more about Solomon another day, but just wanted to illustrate here, like, things were good. Israel wasn't light to the nations in that moment, and then they weren't anymore. But it really is a foretaste of what we expect, like what we long for in the kingdom in the future when you'll have God's people united and worshiping together here on the earth. But God had designed for Israel to be set apart. So Moses is to speak these things to the people. And we see in verse 9, the, of chapter 19 of the book of Exodus, the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will come to you in a thick cloud so that my people may hear when I speak with you and, you, and may also believe in you forever. Thus, or then Moses told the words of the uh, then Moses told the words of the people to the Lord. So God is meeting with Moses. He's coming. He's going to display himself that they would believe in him forever. Like, at this point, what, ha what has God already done for these people? Because I think we see his, his, his kindness on display here. In what way, Henry? Well, God has already shown himself to the people with the display of the plagues and the miracles. He directly led them out of Egypt in a pillar of fire, pillar of cloud, as we saw in Exodus 13 and 14. He had provided for the people abundantly in the wilderness in a miraculous fashion. They wake up and they've got food provided for them. A miraculous fashion with the water coming out of the rock, God standing before the rock in Exodus chapter 17. God had overwhelmingly displayed himself to these people, and yet he's going to do so again. And why is this also kind? Well, because in Exodus 14, 30 through 31, we read that the people believed in the Lord and in Moses, his messenger. And what we had spoken about last week, if you read John 2, for example, you have a statement where it says that the people believed in Jesus. And then it says, but Jesus was not entrusting himself to them for he knew the hearts of men. And when you read entrusting, it's the same word as believe. So they were believing in Jesus, but Jesus wasn't believing in them. What we argued is it was a superficial belief. 
They believed in you know, certain things about Jesus, his name, maybe that he had in fact done miracles, but they did not love him from the heart. And we see another example of that in John chapter 8 with people saying, we're of Abraham. And then Jesus says, you're of your father, the devil. Uh, superficial belief. I think that's what we see here. I think it's even implied from this text because Jesus is, or Moses, who's speaking here? Let me get back into the text here. Exodus 19, let me go back, circling back verse 9. Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will come to you in a thick cloud so that the people may hear when I speak with you and that they may also believe in you forever. Again, the people claim to believe in Moses and then they're complaining against him. They're going against him in uh, the last chapters that we studied through. But anyway, we see that he will be having an extended stay among his creation, which again is an amazing thing. You know, it even highlights and foreshadows what would take place with Christ dwelling with his people incarnate when the word became flesh and would dwell among us, which was future from this standpoint. But then Moses goes on. He does what he's been told to do. He goes, he communicates what the Lord has told him about the people can't approach the mountain. As you read on, if they approach the mountain, they will die. Only when the horn is blown can they approach the mountain. God told them afterwards that they'd have to wait for the third day. Like these amazing events, this spectacle is going to happen. God will be there, but you've got to wait for the third day. Sort of interesting. So they're camping, waiting for the Lord. And I just try to put myself in their shoes, imagining what that would be like. It's like you're before the mountain. God's going to be here in a very direct way. What is that going to be like? Is it going to be like the pillar of fire that we've seen before? Is there going to be a different display Imagine they're probably a little bit on edge just thinking, what will that moment be like? And fortunately, uh, of course, as we know will happen, God is true to his word, and we have that account written out for us. I do want to go ahead and read it. We have time to, verses 16 through 25. So it came about on the third day when it was morning that there were thunder and lightning flashes and a thick cloud upon the mountain and a very loud trumpet sound so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was all in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire, and its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace. And the whole mountain quaked violently. When the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him with thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai, on top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, go down, warn the people so that they will not break through to gaze, break through to the Lord to gaze, and many of them perish. Also, let the priests who come near the Lord consecrate themselves, or else the Lord will break out against them. Moses said to the Lord, the people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for you warned us, saying, set the bounds about the mountain and consecrate it. Then the Lord said to him, go down and come up again, and you and Aaron with you, but do not let the priests and the people break through to come to the Lord, or he will break forth upon them. So Moses went down to the people and told them. What a sight, right? I mean, this is an incredible event. I mean, I imagine you would have chills watching this take place in that moment. There's quaking, there's shaking, there's thunder and lightning, fire descending. They hadn't seen anything quite like this before. It's something they'd never forget. God came to meet with his messenger, Moses, and Aaron as well would be called up to this event. He was meeting with God, possibly in a more direct fashion than what people would see just from the outside with the cloud. There's very direct language here. God descends upon the mountain. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai. The people couldn't come so that they wouldn't gaze. I assume that's gazing upon the Lord. God would be manifest here in a very direct way before the people. It's an awesome event. And it platforms and leads into what comes at the beginning of chapter 20. Now, I do want us to, we'll finish out here in just a a few moments, but I do want to go ahead and read Exodus 20 verses 1 through 2 before we end, because I think it lines up even with what we saw Stephen say in Acts 7.38. Moses writes, then God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. 
And I think that's a reference to our triune God, certainly, which would inc- include the Lord Jesus Christ, um, um, if that is the case, which I think it is. Now, with what we've studied and what we've seen so far, we have seen a number of different things in our text. We've seen a lot of different things going on. I think we've seen Christ at least in a couple of different places in our passage. He's the one that was delivering people. An amazing deliverance. Deliverance is primarily what we studied in our previous times together with the deliverance from Egypt. The people were enslaved in Egypt. And God brought them out. And if you're here this morning and you love the Lord Jesus Christ, then you've been led forth out of slavery as well. Your slavery wasn't found in Egypt, but you were a slave of sin. And it's solely because of the perfect life, substitutionary death, and victorious resurrection of Christ that you're no longer mastered by your sin. You're no longer a slave to sin, even as Cain was when the Lord had said, sin shall no, do not let sin be master over you. But if you're here this morning and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, if you do not love him, then that means you are still a slave to sin. Sin is master over you. In Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 through, or verses, verse 2, we read, Many of those who slept in the dust of the ground will awake, these to everlasting life, but others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. If you do not love the Lord Jesus Christ, if you have not put your faith in him, if you have not turned from your sin under the Lord Jesus Christ, you will awake to everlasting contempt one day. That is because you've sinned against a perfectly holy God who has called you to live perfectly. One lie separates you from him for an, an eternity, for, and you're destined for everlasting contempt. And it's because he is perfect and he is a just judge, the just judge of all the earth, that that is the case. But if you turn, if you run to the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, believing in him, trusting in him, you will be freed from your sins. But beyond just being freed from your sins and having them forgiven, you will be given everlasting life, eternal life, new life. You will be a new creature in Christ. And that can happen for you this morning. That's what I beg you would do this morning, that you would turn to the Lord Jesus Christ if you do not know him. This is the one Moses loved. It's the one Moses believed in. And you might be thinking, Moses loved Jesus. Oh, yes, he did. He loved Jesus above the reproaches of Egypt. We see that. Or uh, he considered the reproach of Christ greater than the riches of Egypt. I want to go ahead and read just a few verses from Hebrews 11, verses 24 through 29. By faith, Moses, when he'd grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Right here, considering the reproach of Christ, Messiah, Jesus, greater than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, the Pharaoh, for he endured as seeing him who is unseen. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood so that he who destroyed the firstborn would not touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as as though they were passing through dry land and the Egyptians, when they attempted it, were drowned. Moses lived by faith. That's what he's characterized by. And he was a man who had faith in the Messiah and he walked by that faith. And that is my prayer for you this morning that you would have that same faith if you do not presently. Now I do recognize where we're stopping today is an odd place to stop. We are stopping at verse two. It's as though we're at the top of a roller coaster and we're about to go through the 10 commandments and we're saying, hold on, we're not gonna do it today. We're gonna stop right here. We're gonna stop in verse two. We're actually not going to focus on the Ten Commandments in this study, though I encourage you to read through them if you'd like. There are more than Ten Commandments that the Lord gives. These are the first ten. Give 613 to the people of Israel to keep under the Old Covenant. But we will continue to go through and we'll consider, uh, even next week, we'll spend some time within uh, this encounter that Moses has with God. So that is the plan 
But I do want to go ahead and come back to the question that I asked originally. Is Jesus at Mount Sinai? Is he involved in the giving of the law? I think the answer to that is yes. And now there might be some discrepancy as to whether, as to how directly you view him as being involved, but at the end of the day, this is a something that comes from our triune God. God is behind this, which means Jesus certainly is behind this. And I think there is a compelling biblical case that can be made, even from appealing to texts that we've already looked at in Exodus 3 and 4, to argue that we do see Jesus Christ even in these passages that we've looked at today. But I invite you back next week. We'll actually be considering uh, uh, some verses in Exodus chapter 24. But with that being said, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in a word of prayer uh, to conclude our time of study this morning. Uh, Father, we are so grateful that we get to serve you. And Lord, what a privilege it is being able to walk through this passage this morning. Lord, we see your grace on display toward these people, this rebellious people, and how you are faithful to your word always. And Lord, that encourages our hearts. It affirms the things we know to be true. And Lord, it gives us such great hope of the future with all the promises that you have laid out for us, knowing that you are true to your word. Father, we've been reminded this morning of the deliverance that you provided to your people from Egypt. We praise you for that. And Father, I pray if there are any here who have not been delivered from their slavery to sin, Lord, that you would cause them, that you would awaken them to life today, that they would see the glory of Christ for the first time, and that they would come to love you even as uh, Moses does, or Moses did and does, uh, even presently. Uh, Father, we love you. We pray you would do a work in our lives through this text, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.